For more, we are well represented on both sides of this matchup. The most prolific passer in the history of Notre Dame football, Brady Quinn, alongside Mr. Seminole himself, Bryant McFadden. Gentlemen, what a show here to round out week one. The Irish, they squander that 18 point lead with 14 minutes to play. Mike Norvell essentially ices his own kicker and the Irish intern squeaking out of Tallahassee with an overtime win. Uh, to the victor goes the spoils here, Brady. Plenty to clean up for the Irish, no doubt. You walk away from this one feeling what? Uh, lucky. <laughs> like we had the luck of the Irish in this one because, as you had pointed out, giving up an 18 point lead, considering that the flow of the game at that point in time, the way the defense was playing, constantly putting pressure on Jordan Travis, I think also getting the better of the Florida State coaching staff with some of their scheme. And then Marcus Freeman, the defensive coordinator for Notre Dame, decided to go more with a three down front, play a bit more conservatively, only a five man box at times. And Florida State continued to run the football, and it really wasn't until, I guess, as, as fortune would have it, Jordan Travis gets his helmet knocked off, insert Mackenzie Milton, and then the passing game comes alive for Florida State as they start to mount a comeback. So, look, this is why college football is the greatest. You had so many different storylines, whether it was the tribute to the late and great Bobby Bowden before the game, Mackenzie Milton, a player who hadn't played in over a 1,000 days, coming back from what seemed like to be an impossible uh, surgery and rehab just to get to this point to be able to play. And then a Notre Dame Irish team that just didn't seem to want to give up. So despite of all that, the Irish got a win, uh, but there's definitely some concerns. I mean, it, we talked about the quarterback play. I think Jack Cohn was probably the bright spot, pretty consistent mm -hmm. next to the wide receivers. Uh, but then the offensive line, they struggled at times, still trying to gel together. The defense touched on that. So definitely still some concerns moving forward. I'm taking a look at this one from the wagering window. Florida State is your ticket staying inside that seven here in overtime. This one comes in well over the total. So uh, you don't need to win in the final score to end up a winner here on HQ. But BMAC, this is big boy football, and there is no such thing as a moral victory. Your alma mater, they take number nine into deep water here. Can you take away any positives from this Knowles effort here on Sunday night? Well, Joe, they didn't lay down. They fought back. They were faced against some big time adversity, especially in the second half, and they just kept their head focused, straight, and balled. 18 points in the fourth quarter against a very, very talented, talented team with experience, outstanding coaching staff, a team that has playoff aspirations. So me personally, it's a tough way to lose, especially when you talk about honoring the great, the late great Bobby Bowden losing on a missed field goal and coming so close. But in years past, trust me, I know, the teams that I've seen from Florida State would have laid down, would have went into the locker room in the second half, especially being down double digits in the second half. But this is a team that fought back. So there were some bright spots. We saw a different defensive front. For I haven't seen this type of pass rush from Florida State in a long, long time. You know what I mean? And being able to establish the ground and pound attack as well. They had over 260 yards on the ground. So those were two impressive things. There's a lot to learn from this tape, but this should be a step in the right direction because they compete against one of the top teams, a top 10 team in the nation. And like Brady said, the luck of the Irish came through. Yeah, I, I know you were fired up throughout the game there, BMAC, watching that Knowles defense fly around, lay some hats. Definitely plenty to clean up on both sides of this one. But the quarterbacks, they were the real question marks heading into this one. You got a transfer on one side, a late decision on the other side. We end up seeing both of those quarterbacks. Brady, you mentioned it. Cohen goes 26 uh, of uh, 36, I believe, and he goes for 355 uh, through the air, four touchdowns, 366 through the air, excuse me, four touchdowns in his Irish debut. Little slow to get going, but he did deliver some nice balls there down the stretch in the second half. How do you grade out Cohen here in his first go around with the Irish? Look, he did enough to get the job done. You know, is it where I think you'd like to see him by the end of the year? Obviously not, uh, even though he's a guy who's experienced. You know, he's still continuing to develop chemistry with this group and feel comfortable with the offense. But some big plays early. Michael Mayo there on the fourth down, wide open, hard to miss him there. And look, he put some balls in some great spots where he gave Mayer in particular opportunities on a third down. That was a drop. And even at the end of the game, perfect ball to set him up for the game winning field goal. Uh, but to me, it was the it was the chemistry with the wide receiver. Joe Wilkins with the big touchdown catch. Kevin Austin, who also showed up big today and really spreading the football around. Chris Tyree able to take the football into the end zone at the running back position. It seemed like, you know, they really did a good job of spreading the football around and utilizing a lot of their playmakers, a lot of the talent that they have within this offense. So he demonstrated a strong understanding of what their offensive coordinator, Tommy Reese, wanted to do. Was it as good as it needs to be, I think, ultimately to compete 
potentially for a national championship? No, but it's only week one. It doesn't have to be. So I think it's a, a great step forward in the right direction. Yeah, Jack played pretty good football. Um, I mean, he was poised. Granted, he was harassed the entire ball game, it seemed like. But he was hitting his pass catchers. And granted, his numbers should be better than what they were because he had so many drop passes from shorthanded guys. Uh, so the moment was never too big for Jack. And that's something that I wasn't surprised to see because he's been around college football for quite some time. You know, he's been able to showcase his skill set on a big, big stage. Uh, and he was able to do that tonight. So me personally, I tip my hat to him because in a night where the offensive line wise, they couldn't really generate the ground and pound game like many expected for them to be expected to see them do. He was able to showcase his arm and he put the team on his back. So that's something to look forward to, because when you lose a guy like Ian Book, you don't know exactly who you will get to replace him. He might not be as athletic as Ian Book, being able to make guys miss in the pocket. But tonight he really showcased quality, sound accuracy, and he was poised for four quarters. And I think he opens up to the downfield passing game, something that they just didn't have quite as much with Ian Book. But, B Mac, I had to ask you about this because I, I was, I'm watching the first drive and I'm watching Florida State either cover Michael Mayer one on one or not at all. <laughs> I mean, look, this guy is going to be a Blitnikoff, or excuse me, a Mackey finalist or winner. Uh, he's one of the best tight ends in the country. There's all this hype about him. He's clearly their most consistent catcher. He went for nine catches, 120 yards, and a touchdown. He should have had more than that, as you had kind of pointed out. Were you not frustrated with them not trying to double him or cover him better at times? No question. I think when you were going against a guy who will play on Sundays, like you just mentioned, you got to devote extra attention to him, especially in situational moments during the ball game. Third down, third and medium, you know that has he is the safety net for Jack Cohen in Notre Dame's offense. So devote a, a more attention to him and make someone else beat him. And then if you're not going to devote any extra attention to him, have someone around him. That first touchdown on fourth down, it's tough when you give up the conversion, but not only give it up, but they score a touchdown when he's by himself. The arguably the best player on Notre Dame's offense is by himself. That's something that you cannot tolerate. And those little mistakes, not little mistakes, big mistakes, mm -hmm. follow Florida State until the end of this ball game. And that's something that they will correct. They better correct if they, if, they would, if they would like to be a better defensive team. But this was a learning experience for Florida State because I can tell you this much. They have a lot of new guys on the defensive side, a lot of transfers. They got to be on the same page. Coach LaPoe used to tell us all the time in Pittsburgh, if we're all going to, if one person is going to play the wrong defense, the other 10 better play the wrong defense as well. And I'm okay if everybody plays the wrong defense the wrong way, but everybody has to be on the same page. And on that uh, potential play, Clearly, they were not in the secondary. Yeah, that would look like uh, seven different guys playing seven different defenses because there were two drag routes that would have scored six on that Mayer touchdown as well. Just a complete breakdown in the back end, but it ended up being a great game. Guys, we do have to talk about the quarterback situation on the other side of this one. We do get to see both QBs, uh, Jordan Travis, McKenzie, Milton. As we said, great story there with Milton comes in when the helmet comes off. Uh, and they say you can't lose your job to injury. You can lose it to oddity, apparently. We were talking before we jumped on here on HQ, gentlemen. BMAC, you feel like it's a pretty plain to see answer here for the Knowles moving forward at the quarterback position. I mean, from my viewpoint, I think it is. I'm so happy I'm not Coach Novell because he actually has to make a decision and get this, Brady. Whoever he names to be the starting quarterback next year, I mean, next week, is going to do big time numbers because they're playing Jacksonville State. So whoever gets the opportunity to be the starting guy probably will be the starting guy from here on out because they're going to do nice numbers. I can tell you this much. Jordan Travis fought. He had some real good plays. He had some bad plays. But he played with a lot of energy, and he made things happen. My concern for McKenzie Milton, outside of being away from the game for such a long time, the mobility. Will he be able to make people miss? And that's something that I've talked to Brady about. I was surprised when he got in the ball game. He looked quick. He wasn't uh, cautious and, 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 and he wasn't second guessing himself when he needed to run. He was just laying on the line. And this pass right here, whoo, that's a big time throw. That's a big time throw. So for me, guys, if I was Coach Norvell, I think I would go with McKenzie Milton. And here's why. He is a better thrower of the football than Jordan Travis. He can make big time throws in certain situations in the first half. Jordan Travis, if the first progression was not there, he got rattled. And granted, the pocket was collapsing, but you know Brady playing quarterback. You got to be cool. Even when the pocket <laughs> collapsed, you have to find a way to go to your second or third progression and try to get the job done. That's an issue 
for Jordan Travis. It, it has been for quite some time. So me personally, I'll go McKenzie, and maybe when I get in the red zone, I change it up a little bit, put Jordan in the game during the red zone opportunities. But McKenzie might have to be my guy if I was a head coach. This is such a tough decision. And, if, you know, if Florida State would have won the game, I think the answer would have already been out there for you. You know, you go with McKenzie Bill and you go with the hand. Uh, maybe you feel like you still go with the momentum because, you know, you felt like you had that once he came back in the game. And as BMAC, as you touched on, clearly a better ability to spit around the football. Now, I, I would argue this. I don't know that his arm is quite as strong, but I think he anticipates. I think he's accurate. I think he knows where the football should be going. Uh, it just seems like he's able to kind of navigate the pocket a little bit too. So there's no doubt he adds that element of the passing game. But it really comes down to, you know, when you look at what this offense, what this team is going to be, um, you know, they, they seem to be able to run the football effectively. Either it's that or Notre Dame's offense just can't stop the run or defense can't stop the run at this point in time. Uh, but Jay Sean Corbin had himself a day. And if Jordan Travis back there at the quarterback position, and BMAC, we talked about this in the pregame. You talked about this in, in particular. If, if Jordan Travis gives you that element of quarterback run game and, and the ability to create, if you're going to struggle to pr protect Mackenzie Milton, then I think there's a reason why we want Jordan, Jordan Travis to start the game in general. Uh, and so it, it's a tough decision to make because I think you really need to look at your team and where you are now, where you want to be. If you feel like you're leaving some plays out there in the passing game, and that ultimately could have been the difference in the game, if you started Mackenzie Milton, then you go with Milton moving forward. But if you like some of the things that Jordan Travis did, as far as getting outside the pocket, running the football, adding to that, thinking you're going to have some offensive line issues as you continue on throughout the ACC, then yeah, maybe Jordan Travis, it's better to stick with him in there or at least give him another shot to see if he can improve his passing while he still has that athletic um, you know, element to his game that really played a huge part in their comeback. I know it's tough to trot out too, but it looks like they might have a nice little two-headed approach there uh, in FSU with the Knowles trying to move forward, figure out who their quarterback is. Plenty needs to be figured out, gentlemen. Week one always does come with a little rust, especially on that offensive side of the ball. Early season adjustments on both sides. BMAC, what are you coaching up your Knowles on Monday morning in the film room? Uh, just situational football. You got to be better on the defensive side. Third down, fourth down. You got to know exactly what you're supposed to do and execute your job. That's something that they have to get better at. And also being under, be understanding who's on the football field. We just talked about some of the key components for Notre Dame, not getting the attention they deserve. You got to understand who's on the football field. And offensively, number one, you got to do a better job offensive line-wise in protecting your quarterback. Number two, you got to find out who will be the quarterback from here on out, Florida State, <laughs> Coach Novell. And I can say this much, it was a loss. There's no, there's no such thing as moral victories, but they fought. That's a bright spot because I've seen this team lay down in years past. They fought, played against a talented team, and hopefully they can build and learn from this loss to go ahead and compete and be a team that comes through a big-time victory. So those are the things I think they should definitely work on and, and, and just try to get better and get ready for Jacksonville State. Yeah, it's not a W on the schedule, but no doubt some value of being in that situation here on Sunday night. Brady, what about on the Irish side of things? As you mentioned, plenty to be desired on both sides of the trenches for Notre Dame. Uh, next week, it's Toledo, so might be able to work some things out, figure some things out in the trenches with the offensive line and the defensive line coming up short of maybe the expectation that's been trotted out in front of them. What's Coach Kelly stressing uh, heading into the work week here? Yeah, look, I, I got to be honest with you. Two of the three things that I talked about where the keys are, are still my concerns moving forward. The offensive line, in particular, that left tackle spot. You saw the true freshman, Blake Fisher, in there to start the game. Might have been some struggles there. They put in Michael Carmody uh, throughout the game, too. At least he was in there to finish. Uh, so kind of interesting decision, and, and I'm not sure if they thought Blake Fisher was struggling, if it's due to injury. We don't know, but that's something they need to sort out. They got to figure out a way of getting their best five out there on the field because this has been a team that's identity has been running the football and they only averaged 1.9 yards per carry. And, and as much as you want to give Florida State credit for that, there's, they still need to find that kind of bread and butter. I mean, one of the things you saw, too, is more three wide receiver sets, four wide receiver sets, spreading the field out more. Is that really what's most beneficial for their personnel moving forward? It seemed like it was, at least in the passing game mm -hmm. at times, uh, but, but it's something that didn't necessarily pay off quite as much. So, And look, defensively, they opened up in a three-down front which I was kind of a little bit surprised by thinking, okay, Mark, Marcus Freeman knows what he's doing. It's the first time doing this. I think it hurt them down the stretch. You know, I, I think their inability to stop the run and rely on their secondary and playmakers like Kyle Hamilton, who showed up big time tonight, uh, their inability to want to do that, uh, to me, was a big mistake. So they've got to come back to the drawing board defensively from a scheme 
uh, standpoint. And then I think the last thing, this might be most important, Michael Mayer, figure out if you want to wear gloves or not. Because you dropped <laughs> one without, dropped one with gloves. But let's get this figured out, buddy. You're too good of a prospect, too good of a player. Go gloves. If you're going gloves, stick with them. If you don't go with gloves, you know, just go barehanded. Get, get a little sticky tack or something on your hands. Figure it out, man. We need you. Brady, I need you to get into that uh, Notre Dame quarterback group text that I know you got. Talk to your boy Tommy Reese. Tell him stretch it out. You got some weapons out there on that Notre Dame offense. We got weapons right here on CBS Sports HQ as well. Brady B. Mac, thank you as always. And don't forget, it's time to get involved. Download and subscribe the All Things Covered podcast. Our guy Bryant McFadden, his cousin Patrick Peterson, sitting down with some of the biggest names in all of sports. Can't miss interviews week after week. Download, subscribe, and enjoy All Things Covered. Want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.